Okay? Where does fear come from? Um, fears can be acquired evolutionary. There are some fears that this, your affective nervous systems come into the world with some things built in because the ancestors you had that survived survived because they avoided certain things. And um, my uh, story of this is uh, I had a pet rat, Herbie, in Portland, Oregon. And um, Herbie was, a, I raised him from four day old so he never saw anybody else. And um, he uh, cathected, as they used to call it, but he bonded with me because uh, I was his only parent for a long time. So he wasn't afraid of me. We would, you know, I didn't have to put him in a cage. He lived in an apartment with me and, uh, you know, it was normal. Um, and uh, then one day uh, the neighbor uh, got, a, um, uh, got a little kitty cat, little teeny kitty. And I thought, oh wow, the kitty was barely got its eyes open, really tiny little thing. And I thought, ah, Herbie. And Herbie went everywhere with me and everything. And I thought, Herbie should see the kitty cat. So we go over to meet the kitty cat and Herb goes into a full extension rigidity, total overwhelmed with fear, which completely shocked me because he'd never seen a cat before in his entire life, anything like this. So that was built in pretty deep in Herbie. And um, Herbie was, in fact, actually traumatized Herbie. Never uh, ran, when we got home, he ran directly in his cage, wouldn't come out of his cage for days. Um, so huge. So some kids come in with, uh, hyper-exaggerated fears. Um, some of them are just part of our DNA um, and uh, most of them don't interfere much with schooling but some sometimes do. But anyway, they're, they come in that way. And uh, others um, we acquire uh, over ontogeny, over development. Um, I used to get very sick with chocolate um, and when I was a very young child, I don't even remember it, but as a result, my nervous system learned to fear chocolate. So it's not part of something I think about. And so uh, chocolate disgusts me. And it's always a surprise like to other people like you, you're thinking, how could that happen? So I've never eaten chocolate. And it's not like when you put a chocolate cake out for me, people always think, wow, it must be such a disability that you look at, you know, you want to eat the chocolate cake. And I say, it, you know, for me, it looks like a piece of, uh, you know, dungy cardboard. It's like, why would you want to eat that? Is the way my nervous system is like, it looks awful. So I never have this feeling I'm missing out on anything. I just think, you guys are weird wanting to eat things like that. Um, but that's been learned by my nervous system because I got really sick and the nervous system really learns that well. Um, and uh, I'll show that slide. I think I want to do these three together. Um, I uh, had a, I fly a lot. Um, I had a uh, trauma trip. I'm going to do this fast because I want to catch up. But um, had a, a flight from hell where we uh, uh, were under what they pilot came on and said, "Okay, we're going to run into some violent turbulence." And when you know you've all heard, well, "We're going to have a little turbulence. We're going to have some moderate chop or something." You think, "Okay, this is not good." When he said violent turbulence, you can imagine we went, "Oh, this is not not a word we like to hear." Anyway, so we hit violent turbulence and. Um, the airport closed, we couldn't get down, blah, blah, blah. And then we were hit by lightning in the middle of the flight and it just this explosion and we all thought we were dying. And it was unbelievable. Well, um, the guy next to me, we finally did get down after this traumatizing thing. And um, he said to me, we both had our feet up on the back of the seat of the one in front of us. We were like in total, uh, still frozen with fear. And he says, you know, this happened to me a few years ago. It took me two years to get over it. <laughs> and, I was, and boy, that has been true. I am so traumatized by flying. You know, I just, I'm, I'm mostly over it now, but this was four years ago. And uh, so what's this all about? That, the, um, that some of your fear stuff, the stuff that's learned through the amygdala is really, really well learned. You don't forget it and it's very hard to unlearn it. Your nervous system is not designed to unlearn it. It's designed to make that never happen again. So it's really adaptive. 
your ancestors that saw a lion charging at them and saw you know, your neighbor getting eaten by a lion, it wants to remember that forever. That's the, the ones that survived remembered it forever with fear. And you don't want to sort of forget it. Go, oh, now, let's see now. Oh, the lion came. It, it, it was eating my friend. And um, this, is, this is the reason that those ancestors don't have children, OK? And um, so you want your nervous system to be very fast. So what you develop is this very low level, what's called a short route by some people, that your very old, dumb nervous system really learns things that are very frightening. And you also have ability to learn things later, like chocolate and so on. Um, but these are very fast acting, which is why when you're walking in a, a um, trail and you, if someone gives you an anticipatory set and says, oh, this is a great trail, there might be a rattlesnake in there. I'm not sure. So then it takes just a little, little noise, and your whole nervous system does this. OK? Um, does a big jolt and gets your adrenaline going so you can do the things you need to do. Um, and, um, and it's very hard to stop that from happening um, because it happens very quickly. And let me bring this into the classroom. Um, this was a study done by uh, a, a new person at CAST um, when she was a doctoral student at Harvard. And it's very powerful. Um, she was measuring stress physiologically on uh, middle school kids. And they'd come in and, and she would uh, wire them all up and then she'd have them do uh, some reading. And the idea was that she would have them read under a couple of conditions. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. But um, her research was astonishing unexpectedly. Um, because what she was doing, she was measuring everything, and she was waiting to see whether under one condition their anxiety would be less than the other. But she didn't get any effects, for reasons we'll talk about, but she didn't get any effects. And what she l went back and looked at her data, and what she found out was that the kids, they would come into this room, no, no pressure, there was no big you know, testing or anything, but they were going to read, and that the kids came in in two different levels of stress. All the kids she had identified, two, two kinds of kids, kids with reading difficulties and kids, uh, typically achieving kids. The kids with reading difficulties came in at a highly elevated stress level right from the beginning of their moments in the room. Before she had them read anything, they already went into high stress. Uh, so this is their stress level. This is typical kids. Now what she doesn't know and is going to do the research on, were they walking around all day in school like that? Were they like your ancestors walking in the jungle where there are lions? Are they walking around all day at a high stress level like she measured when she first measured it? Because it was instantaneous when she put the stuff on. They were already under high stress. They hadn't read a thing. So the possibility is that they are walking around all day like your ancestors in a jungle full of lions. That is to say, they're waiting for something bad to happen. They are stressed. And what we know is that that is very bad for learning. It doesn't help you learn. And it's very bad. It's caustic for your nervous system. It's not good to be under chronic stress for your nervous system. And so we may have to put a warning sign on schools that say, like cigarette ads, <laughs> caution, this could be deleterious to your health. If you are a poor reader and you're in middle school, it could be that you are entering a damaging situation. It's certainly psychologically damaging, but what is likely is that it's physiologically damaging. Yeah? I'm just wondering, how, how is she measuring this? She's measuring a physiologic heart rate, skin conductance, hot pupils, things like that. So it's the low level. It's we're measuring the real stress, not the kids' reporting of their stress. So the actual physical. Symptoms. Physically, we can see there that low part of the nervous system is just like you've just said. There's a snake there. It's firing. It's going. I'm under. I'm under stress. So they are chronically under stress. Well, we don't know they're chronically under stress. We know they're under stress when we ask them to read. 
So that's a big thing um, to be worried about, that some kids are in a very different stress environment than other kids. I want to skip those because I want to get to the how do we manage, because this will get to the UDL part, how do we manage things like fear? Uh, what do we do? And I want to say that the one thing that doesn't work is to say to the kids, don't be afraid. <laughs> Has no effect whatsoever. Um, and the reason, I, I didn't want to get too much into it, the reason is this. Your thoughts about that this could be a dangerous place activate the amygdala negatively. That is, if you think it might be frightening, it gets the amygdala all ready for frightening things to happen. Thoughts that are trying to turn it off are not so effective. It's very hard to tell yourself, don't be afraid. It doesn't look like our nervous systems are designed to do that well. Okay? So the idea of saying to a kid, don't be afraid, this is going to be different, or you're going to like this subject, even though you've had a history of failing all of your subjects. That, the nervous system is not prepared to learn that. It's learned a very core thing um, about the situation that is fear-inducing, and it's very hard to fix it. 